What's up folks, this is Rev Bari, Brown University physics grad student. Today we're going to be discussing gravitational waves, ripples through the fabric of space and time that are caused by two black holes orbiting each other. Let's go ahead and dive into the math and physics of binary black holes. Alright, so what are gravitational waves? Gravitational waves are just like ripples on a pond, except replace that pond by the fabric of space and time itself. Gravitational waves are amazing because they demonstrate that space and time obey Einstein's field equations. In other words, space and time is just like a mattress. If you move an object in space and time from one place to another, moving that object changes the metric that describes space and time, and changing the metric releases radiation. To give you an idea of how gravitational waves function, we should look at its anal analogy in electromagnetism. In electromagnetism, what we have are charges. So imagine you have an electron. If this electron is not moving, if it's stationary in some rest frame, then this electron just has some given electric field, right? The electric field of this electron is just electric lines, electric field lines pointing inwards, right? What if this electron began to move? Well, if the electron began to move, then the electric field of the electron would have to change. So let's say the electron moved from here to a different location. Let's say it moved from here to here. Well, in that case, the electric field lines that are closest to the electron would change first. So what would happen is that, for example, this nearest part, oh, this is garbage, bye-bye. So the closest part of the electric field would deviate first, this would deviate first, and the farther away parts would not know that the electron had moved yet. So what you get at the end is a kind of spider-like electric field. So let me draw the resultant electric field after the electron has moved with some constant velocity. So here is my electron at its new location, okay? Maybe it was originally here. And after the electron has moved, the electric field lines closest to the electron immediately, not immediately, but they change the fastest. And the electric field lines outwards have actually not received the information about the fact that the electron has moved yet. So moral of the story is that information propagates at the speed of light. So there will actually be an information bubble, an information bubble surrounding the electron in the following way. I'm going to draw an information bubble that surrounds the electron, and this bubble expands at the speed of light. So hopefully I have colors other than blue and, oh my god. Okay, so here is the information bubble surrounding the electron. And this bubble expands outwards at the speed of light, informing the electric field lines further away that the electron has moved. This is the radiation you might see from an electron moving at some given speed. But here's the thing. This electron has to be accelerating for us to receive radiation from it. Why? Well, if an electron is moving at a constant velocity, if it's not accelerating, Here's an amazingly simple way to show that it has no radiation. If an electron is moving at constant velocity, it has no radiation because we could transform. We could Lorentz boost to a frame where this electron is not moving. That is the rest frame of the electron. In the rest frame of the electron, we're co-moving with the electron. It looks like the electron has no velocity. And so if it has no velocity, then its electric field lines should just remain stationary, right? And so that's why an electron or any charge moving at constant velocity does not emit radiation. On the other hand, there is no way you can Lorentz boost to a frame where the electron is not accelerating. If this electron does have some constant acceleration, there is no rest frame of the electron. You have to be co-accelerating with the electron to see it not moving. But co-accelerating frames are not inertial reference frames. And so because of that, electrons that are accelerating do emit radiation. And in fact, there's a very simple way we can calculate the radiation they emit. We can use a simple harmonic oscillator model. Let's use that model. Imagine you have a spring, a mass on a spring. For a mass on a spring, 
we can easily show that the power is work over time and in particular power is proportional to the amplitude of the acceleration squared okay so what is acceleration for a spring well the position of a spring we know that a spring has a restoring force f equals ma is minus kx now a is of course the second derivative of x so if i solve this ode i find that x is some um, sinusoidal obviously or cosine depending on your boundary conditions now i take the derivative of this to get my velocity function this gives me a omega cosine omega t and then i take the second derivative to get my acceleration function a omega squared minus sine omega t now the power is proportional to the acceleration squared right in particular the amplitude of the acceleration squared the sine squared over if we average the sine squared part that will just give us a factor of a half right because sine is a sinusoidal so this if i square the amplitude here this gives me a squared times omega to the fourth that means the power released by an accelerating charge is proportional to the fourth power of the angular frequency what does that mean that means the sky is blue and here's the reason why if you look at the electromagnetic spectrum so here is the electromagnetic spectrum we've got let's say very high wavelength light on the right for example this could be radio waves this could be microwaves and we've got let's say infrared over here we've got visible light in this small section here we've got what am i missing we've got uv ultraviolet we've got Infrared is on this side because these are high wavelengths and at this end at the very low uh, Frequency edge of the visible we have red at the very high frequency part of visible. We have violet and blue Okay, so that's why UV is next to violet infrared is next to red in the visible and then we have what maybe gamma rays and that's I think that's pretty much it so if you look at the visible spectrum the highest frequency light is violet and blue so that's why blue light gets scattered the most in the in our sky why not violet well it turns out that the Sun as a black body at a, of a given temperature in fact if you plot the black body spectrum for an object with a surface temperature of 6,000 degrees Kelvin you'll find that that object uh, it's its primary emission in the visible spectrum is mostly in the blue and the green and green does not scatter as much as blue so blue is why the sky is well blue it's a combination of two facts the sun being a black body at 6000 degrees kelvin emits more blue than violet and even though the sun also emits a lot of green green is not scattered as much because the power of an accelerating charge goes as omega to the fourth this is a lot more radiation now in the next episode we're going to take this idea of more radiation and generalize it to gravitational radiation to show why in gravity, in the case of gravity, we don't have monopole radiation, we don't have dipole radiation, instead we have quadrupole radiation, which is the, not the first, not the second, but third order derivative of what is called the inertia tensor of a gravitational mass field. On the other hand, in the case of electromagnetism, we don't have monopole radiation, so that means an oscillating body of charge, an oscillating sphere of charge would not emit radiation, whereas an accelerating charge or a dipole, a dipole that's, uh, that consists of maybe a rotating two charges or an oscillating charge back and forth, a dipole does emit radiation. So in the next episode, we're going to generalize electromagnetism to gravity to show the analog of Larmor radiation is gravitational radiation, also known as gravity waves. I'll see you in the next episode.